Thank you for joining us today for the comeback. I want you to know that I believe with all of my heart that this word has been specifically designed by God for your life. I believe he's tailored it so that it could be a source of encouragement and strength to you today. I want you to take just a few moments and lean in and listen to this word and let it speak to you today. And I'm going to come back and pray for you in just a few moments. Uh, I want you to go with me to Genesis, the 32nd chapter uh, and the 24th verse. And Pastor Ron, I want you to keep your mic nearby. Genesis, the 32nd chapter and the 24th verse. In this verse, the, the character in the word that we're going to be talking about today is this guy by the name of Jacob. So in Genesis 32 and 24, it says this, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Again, it says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man, notice the word man, is a capital M. It's not a lowercase m. And that's going to be significant in a few moments. But Jacob was left alone, and then a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And again, from this scripture, we get our thought for today, which is this. You got a fight on your hands. Now, I know that's not uh, cor uh, correct uh, grammatically, but it's ebonically correct. It would be normally you have a fight on your hands, but that doesn't have the emotion I wanted it to have. It's you got a fight on your hands. So that's what we're going to talk about today. You got a fight on your hands. Now, there's this guy named Jacob, and the Bible says that he was in a private place. Go back to that scripture for me real quick, 32, 24. It says that Jacob was left alone. Now, this is significant because Jacob was with a company of hundreds of people he was responsible for a whole lot of people and cattle and, and, and all types of sheep and things of this nature. And they were moving from one place to another place so that they could find a permanent dwelling for Jacob and his inhabitants and the people that were with him. But at this particular time, what was happening was that Jacob's brother Esau was trying to find him and possibly kill him. Esau was mad with Jacob because Jacob stole Esau's birthright. Jacob was in a fight with Esau. Esau didn't like his brother because he felt like his brother was a, a thief. And he stole from him things that were rightfully due to him. So now Jacob is with his company of people and he is going to another land to establish a future. And as he's going to another land, he sends word to his brother through a peacekeeper and says, tell my brother, I don't have no quarrel with him. I don't want to fight with him. I want us to live in peace. And the word came back that Esau was like, I'm not looking for peace. I'm looking to make things right. I'm looking to make things even. So as a result, Jacob was troubled. So Jacob in this scripture, he's left alone. He tells everybody else, you all go your different ways. He took his people that were with him, split them into two groups. It was a strategy thing that he did, told split them into two groups. And he said, now I'm going to go by myself to a private place. Jacob went by himself to a private place for one purpose, and that purpose was so that he could pour out his soul in prayer and that he could spread his cares and his fears before God. Jacob got to a private place. Jacob got to a place where he was by himself because he knew his future was at stake. And he knew that because his future was at stake that he had to get in touch with God. I don't know about you, but there are times in your life when your future is at stake. How do I mean? Well, for example, your job is saying they're getting ready to lay off. 
or because of the housing market, the house that you're renting, the owner now wants to sell, and you can't afford to buy it. Or because of the housing market, you're trying to buy a house, but every time you go, you get outbid. Your future is at stake. Are y'all still with me? You're trying to, to go up the ladder and do things better. Your future is at stake. You're in a pivotal place. And what we should all do when we are in these pivotal places is not run from God and not run to people. Our key to victory, our key to our future being exactly what God said for it to be is for us to get alone and to get to a private place and for us to pour out our soul to God in prayer. God, I'm in trouble. God, I need you. Father, just like we sang this morning, Lord, I need you to make a way. When my back is against the wall and it looks like everything is over, Lord, in the past you made a way. And I'm standing here only because you made a way. The same God that did it for you before is the same God will do it for you again, but he's waiting for you to get to a private place, to get to a desperate place, to get to a place to where you are saying, God, I'm pouring out my soul. I'm pouring out my heart to you in prayer. God, I need you. I need you right now. I remember growing up in the Baptist church, there's a song that we used to sing. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Anybody know that song? Not my mother, not my father. But it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. This is the place and the time and the moment that you have got to say, God, it's about me and you. Because listen, this fight for your future, watch this. No one can fight for your future but you. Why? Because it's your future. Somebody can fight with you, but they can't fight for you. If you're in a fight and you call us and say, Pastor Jason, Pastor Rhoda, we're going through this thing here. Can you pray with us? Yes, we can fight with you in prayer, but we can't do for you what you won't do for yourself. Because this fight for your future is not the fight for my future. It's the fight for your future. So if this is the future that you want and you are fighting for it, you engage that fight first in a place of prayer in a place of, of, of reading his word. See, see, I don't know if you know this, but God set us up since the beginning of the year. He told us, Jason, do God first. Do it the first weekend of every single month. And during that time, have the people fast. And so that's what we've been doing. We've been developing our fast. When we announced today what the fast was, that we were fasting beef and chicken, I heard groans throughout the sanctuary. <laughs> Why? Because we naturally don't want to give these things up. But what you don't understand is that God is disciplining you if you follow this fasting schedule, that it disciplines you and it disciplines your body so that when you go into a place of prayer and to a time of prayer, your prayer is more effective because it's more fervent because you mean business with God because you're willing to give up something so that you can gain more with him. Are y'all here today? But can't nobody make you fast. But if there's a future that you're fighting for, a fasting is what you want to do. Why? Because it's a fight for your future. You, you got to get in mind, is there something that I need to be going after? Is there something that God promised me that's worth this fight, that's worth me contending for it in prayer? And I don't know about you, but since this series started, I started seeing the things that God promised I started seeing the prophetic words that were spoken, and I began to realize there is much left for me to fight for. I got a family to fight for. I got a wife to fight for. I got a children, children to fight for. I got grandchildren that are coming later, later, later to fight for. Are y'all here today? I got a church to fight for. I got a legacy to fight for. I have the preached gospel to fight for. Say it. You got to find the thing, what is it that's worth fighting for your future? I don't know about you, but I've been married 25 years. We'll be married 26 years in August. Amen. Woo-hoo. Amen, amen. 
Praise the Lord. But it's been a fight. Come on in here. Oh, y'all got quiet. Oh, Pastor Jason, I just thought it would be magical because you're so handsome. She's so pretty. And you're a preacher. And God loves you. No. I am beautiful. She is pretty. God does love us. But there's still a fight because the enemy loves broken homes. The devil loves for there to be brokenness in the midst of marriage. The, love, the devil loves for two people to be living together but not talking to each other. Are y'all here today? So I got something to fight for. I want the next 26 to be even better than the first 26. Yeah. Y'all got quieted here. That's okay because it ain't your fight. It's mine. Amen. It's worth fighting for. So when something ain't right between her and I, we talk. And when I get done talking to her, I go talk to God. Why? Because I'm fighting for it. I'm not giving the devil not one bit of iota of room in my marriage because he don't deserve it. Because our marriage to God be the glory yeah. for the things he has done. Can I get a whoop whoop from somebody? <laughs> Can I get a whoop whoop in TV land? <laughs> Sounds good. Be willing to fight for it. Somebody say, you got to be willing to fight for it. So if you are willing to fight for it, then listen, this brings us to this point that if you're willing to fight for your future, then you need to know you got to fight on your hands. Every time God speaks a promise of what he wants to do, remember we told you when God speaks a word concerning your future, it's something that he's already decided. It's not something he's thinking about. It's not something he's considering. But when you stumble over a word in his Bible, when you hear a word from your pastor, when there is a prophetic word that is spoken to you, it is not God telling you what he hopes. It is God telling you what he has decided. And you have to make a decision that I'm willing to fight for what God has decided. Y'all got quiet. See, see, I, I'm in a borrowed house right now. I live in a house that's owned by somebody else. Are y'all still with me? I, I pay lease to somebody that owns the house that I live in. But this house that I'm in is not the house that I saw. The house that I saw is bigger. Y'all got quiet. The house that I saw has more square footage. The house that I saw is a ranch all on one level because I'm getting older and I'm not going to be fooling with stairs when I'm 60 <laughs> years old. Are y'all here? This house has a theater in it, so I ain't got to go out to the theater. I can just go downstairs in my basement and watch the movie theater in my house. It's called Turn the Theater. I already got the name. I already see it. Are y'all here? Why, what I am in is not what I saw, I he said and it's not what he stairs. promised me. <laughs> so I got a choice. I can quit fighting and stay right where I am right. and settle. See, a lot of us are settling for our realities be because we're not willing to fight for a future. But I don't know about you, but I'm willing to fight. So I'm going to fight by not spending as much money. I'm going to fight by saving more money. I'm going to fight by still putting in bids and trusting God that he'll give me favor when it's the right time, the right season, the right moment, the right house. Because what God has for me, no devil in hell can stop. Are y'all in here today? only thing that can stop your future is you and you got to decide my future is worth fighting for let me keep going so so Jacob realized man my past hasn't been so great my past has been one full of trickery <coughs> my past has been one full of deceit and I don't want my future to be like my past I sense that this is the moment for me to fight for my future. So we see here again in Genesis 32 and 24, it says he was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Leave that scripture up there. Wrestled with him. So then who was this man? Who was this man that Jacob was wrestling with? Was it, it, was it a physical man? Was it a, a man of a flesh and bone and physical body? It, yes, in that he was able to grab it and touch it, but the Bible says that the man is capital M. Whenever there is a capital pronoun, it is speaking to the presence of God in a bodily form. Whether it is angelic or whether it is Jesus being manifested before he came through 
Joseph and Mary. There are times that Jesus or the word showed up in the form of a man. Are y'all still with me? How do we know this? There's a time in scripture where it says that they took the three Hebrew boys and threw them into the fire. Y'all remember that? Then it says the king looked in and said, how many did we throw in? They said, King, we threw in three. He said, well, there's a problem because there's a fourth one that I see in there. Who was that fourth one? It was Jesus that had manifested himself in a way to be a protection to those that were standing against injustice. He had done it multiple times throughout the Old Testament, and we see it again here. If you go to the scripture that's connected with it, it's Hosea 12 and 4, and Hosea 12 and 4 says this. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. This is the writer referring to Jacob's wrestling. Are y'all still with me? They didn't know how to point and say that this was Jesus. So they gave everything to be an angelic representation or an angelic manifestation. But if we see this scripture, it helps us to connect Back to Genesis 32 and 24 for us to see that what Jacob was wrestling, he was wrestling the manifested word of God. Because the Bible says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And the word became what? Flesh. So whenever you see a man in the Old Testament, capital M, that shows up, it is the manifestation of the word. Are y'all still with me? It's the word of God in a bodily form. Why is this important? Because in Genesis 32 and 24, Genesis 32 and 24, go back. It says, he wrestled with him until the breaking of day. So what does that mean for us? Does it mean that Jesus is going to physically show up in our time of prayer and wrestle with us? No. Because What Jesus needs to do, he's already done. He came, he lived 33 and a half years, he he died, he was crucified, he rose again. Everything that he needs to do is done. So then what does the scripture mean to us? Here's what it means, and please make sure you don't miss this. That when we get into prayer, what we are wrestling is our understanding of God's word. Are you still with me? When we get into a place of prayer, what we are wrestling, we're not wrestling against the word, but we're wrestling to understand it and to release it. If you're going through something and and, and you're sick in your body, and the scripture says, you shall live and not die to declare the works of the Lord. Well, that's the scripture or that's his word that you take into prayer and that you wrestle with. Because wrestling with that word, once you understand it and release it, gets you to the future that was promised. Are y'all still with me? But you can't get to that future that was promised if you're not willing to wrestle with the word. How do I wrestle with the word? You wrestle with it in prayer. God, what does this word mean for me? I see what it says, but God, I don't understand it. But God, I am committed that I'm going to stay here and wrestle with you or wrestle with this word until I get an understanding of it and until it is released over my life. God, if it takes 10 minutes in prayer, then it'll take 10 minutes. But if it takes an hour, it takes an hour. If it takes three hours, it takes three hours. If it takes all night, it'll take all night. If it takes until the breaking of day, then I'm going to wrestle with this word until I get a revelation about what you promised me concerning my future. Because my future just doesn't happen. My future has to be fought for. Are you with me? So I got to fight for it. God, you said you were going to give me a business. How do I get from unemployment to employer? Because that's a big step. But there are steps in between it. So how do you get there? You get there first through fighting in prayer. God, what's next? What do I do? You said I should be the head and not the tail. Is anybody here today? God, you said I should be above and not beneath. Are y'all still here? 
And you're praying this out and you're fighting this out until you get a revelation that God says, here's what I want you to do next. Yeah. And then you get up and you do that next thing. Mm -hmm. Are you still with me? Yeah. I went to bed last night thinking about this word. Mm -hmm. I went to bed at about 10, 1030, thinking about this word. This word was on my mind and on my heart. And at about 2 o'clock, I woke up just from coughing. But I think it was the thing that was needed to wake me up out of my sleep. And I woke up, and I was like, okay, God, I'm up. What's up? Because I would like to go back to sleep. I like the thing that you created for me to have, which is sleep. I said, now, Jason, I want you to be up with me. I said, okay, God, if this is a Jacob thing and you want me to wrestle, let's go. I'll wrestle with the word. And I started praying, started interceding for my family. Started interceding for the church. I started praying until I felt a release, and then I stopped. When I went to sleep, God showed me some stuff in my dreams about things that I had been praying for that apparently couldn't get released until I had fought for it in prayer two hours before. Are you still with me? God wants to talk to you. God wants to show you things. God wants to tell you how to get to the next step, but you've got to be willing to move with him, to wrestle with his word, to pray it out and to pray it through, and to say, God, I'm not getting off of this scripture until I understand what this means for my life, and you wrestle with it. Are y'all still here? Yeah. That's what Jacob did. So I'm going to wrestle with you because I don't want to be like how I was. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be the person that I used to be. I want to be something new. God, I believe you have a bright future for me. And I'm not going to stop wrestling you. Or I'm not going to stop wrestling this word until I understand about my future, what it is that you want to do, what's next, and what it is that I need to respond to. Are you still here? Let's go to the next part of this scripture. I'm skipping some things, so make sure you go back and read it. But go to Genesis 32 and 26. Because I'm going to show you something. Write this down. You got to use what you got to get what was promised. Mm. I'm going to say it again. Pass me a towel. You got to use what you got to get what was promised. A lot of times we say things like this. Well, if I had this, I could go do this. So we use the reason of what we don't have to be a limitation of what we won't go after and what we won't go do. Well, God, if, 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 if I had a little bit better credit, then maybe I could believe you more for this and start to go do this. No, 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 no. See, you got to understand that God, what God wants to do for you, he wants to do for you, not because of you, but he's going to do it in spite of you. <clears throat> all God needs from you is your cooperation to believe him for your future and stop letting your present be a debilitation to what he wants to do in your future stop giving God a list of what you don't have and what you can't do every time God was getting ready to use a, a man to be a great leader for his people that leader would always give God a list of what they couldn't do God doesn't call you because of what you can't do. He calls you because of what he can do in you. Are you here? He has positioned you in the right place because he wants to do something in you that's going to be a witness to people that are around you. And sometimes he's got to move you in order for that to happen. There's some stuff God's going to do for me in Arizona that he couldn't do for me in Wisconsin. Are, are y'all here? Because <sighs> he's, not, he's not limited by your geographical place. He's not limited by what you can't do. I, and I'm going to show you what I mean. Watch this. Go to Genesis 32 and 26. And he said, let me go. This is the man or the manifested word. Said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go. Unless you bless me. Y'all see that? Yeah. You want me to let you go, but I ain't letting you go until you bless me. I'm not letting you come here, get this close to me. I'm wrestling with you 
and I'm wrestling with you and don't get from you what you came to give. I'm not letting you go until you bless me. Jacob made up in his mind, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. Sometimes our problem is that we haven't made the shift in our mind. Oh, y'all got quiet. We have to make the shift in our mind. We got to get it made up in our mind that I'm going to be determined and I'm going to press and I'm going to keep going until I see from God what he promised and what he said. I've got my mind made up. See, when your mind is made up, it don't matter what other people say. Yeah, other people may have influence, but it's not as great as the influence of your mind that has decided, I'm finna ride this out with God. I'm finna see what God's finna do for me. I'm finna fight for the future that God promised me. And my mind is made up. No disappointment is going to shake this. No negative word is going to shift this. Nothing that anybody got to say is going to stop me. I'm going to keep fighting for my future until I kiss my future face to face. Are y'all here? Uh, why did Jacob wrestle? Why didn't it say that, that, that Jacob boxed with the man? It didn't say he boxed with him. See, you got to understand, things in the word are specific. They're not accidental. Everything that God says is on purpose. It didn't say that Jacob boxed with him. It didn't say that Jacob karate with him. Are y'all here? It didn't say that Jacob, uh, what's another uh, engagement? Uh, uh, karate, boxing, what else we got? Huh? It didn't say thank you. It didn't say that Jacob jujitsued him. He said, I'm not going to stop jujitsuing you until you bless my soul. It didn't say that. It said, Jacob, catch this for me. Jacob wrestled with him. Why did it say that Jacob wrestled with him? Why was Jacob wrestling? Are y'all still with me? Form of fighting. Watch this. Go to Genesis 25 and 26. I'm going to show you something. Genesis 25 and 26. Afterward, his brother came out. So this scripture is talking about Jacob and Esau who were twins in their mother's womb. Are y'all still with me? Come on, holler back at me. Y'all still with me? Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So Esau came out first. Jacob was coming out second. He didn't like coming out second. So he grabbed at Esau's heel to try to pull Esau back in the womb so he could come out first. That's what Jacob was doing before he even got here. Jacob was a wrestler from the womb. took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob because the word Jacob means subplanter or to wrestle. Subplanter means I'm going to take your place by virtue of engagement of wrestling. Are you still with me? So from the womb, Jacob was a wrestler. So when it comes to you getting the things that God would have you to get, Or when it comes to you for fighting for your future, he doesn't want you to be something that you're not. He's asking you to be authentically who you are. Are you here? He wants you to use what you got. And what Jacob had was that he was a wrestler. All I know is wrestling. So if I got to wrestle this word until I get this word to bless me, then I'm going to wrestle this word because I'm a wrestler and that's what I do. So what does that mean for you? It means whatever you are, that's what you do with the word until you get the blessing from the word that God intended for you. So if you're a worshiper, then worship him all night until you get from him the thing that he promised you you can have. If you don't know what your future is, don't try to wrestle like me. Worship like you. 
That's free to be able to know you don't got to be like me. You don't have to be like somebody else. You just got to authentically be like you. If you are one that is a studier, then you study with the word all night until that word blesses you. Are y'all still here? See, see, I'm a studier. I love theological dissertations. And I may have just used some words you don't even know what I'm talking about. But I like that. Theological conclusions from dissertations that deal with the eschological thought of a God that is See, and I can keep going with that. I love that. So when I'm fighting for my future, I'm fighting in prayer, and I'm fighting through my study. God, I got to study this out. I got to find where you are. I got to find what you're saying to me. And that's how I get my fight with the word won. That's how I get the victory is because I study the word, and I'll do it all night until I get a revelation. My wife, on the other hand, is not a studier. That's not what she does. But my wife is a worshiper. She'll start walking through the house and she'll start worshiping. And we'll know this is not the time to interrupt mama. This is not the time to ask her a question. This is the time to get out of her way because mama's talking to God. Mama is worshiping. Mama's walking through the house. Mama's washing dishes and she's worshiping. Mama's folding clothes and she's worshiping because her fight for her future. The fight that she has on her hand is not done the way that I fight. It's done the way that she was designed. She is a worshiper, and I'm a studier. The question today for you is, what are you? And that's what you got to be when you go before God. If you are a crier, then you go before God, and you cry your heart out before God. And you stay there until you get, are y'all here today? And you stay there until you get an understanding of what he's saying. And don't let nobody tell you it don't take all of that. You hush because you don't know what I'm fighting for and you don't know what I'm going after. And it's worth not being a friend to you for a season so I can get to my future, which is everlasting. What are you? Whatever it is, that's what you got to be. Are you a walker? Then you pace the floor. And you pace the floor. You, you, you put burns in your carpet because you pace the floor so much. Whatever it is that you do, do it. Because God doesn't want you going after him, putting on the face of somebody else. What is it that you do? If, it, if it's sitting at a piano, I'm not saying that's you, but if it's sitting at a piano and it's playing until there's a breakthrough in your heart and in your mind, then you get you a piano and when you don't know what to do and you don't know where else to go, you get to a quiet place like Jacob did and you wrestle through your fingers as you are waiting for an understanding of the revelation of what it is that God is telling you about your future. Are you here today? Everybody has a different way of getting to God because it's authentically you, and he loves the diversity of it. Don't be me. I'm enough. Is this his last point? Be you. Pass me that time. Be you. I believe so. Do exactly you, and don't do anything else. Be exactly who it is that God called you to be as you wrestle before him. And I'm going to say this thing and then I'm done. Because okay. it's getting a little hot in here. Uh, and I don't yeah. want to take all... Uh, so uh, hot, uh, what y'all been listening to? <laughs> no. My daughter Olivia heard that song for the first time. She's like, ooh, that's a nasty song. I said, it's not really nasty. It's, it's... And the more I thought about it, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, it is. Listen, you got to know You got to fight until something happens. This is what happened for Jacob. He fought all night long. And the scriptures are not up, but I'm going to paraphrase them. Go back and read the story. When Jacob said, I'm not going to stop fighting you. I'm not going to stop wrestling you until you bless me. Again, that's what your fight is, God. I'm not letting you go. I'm not stopping. I'm not changing my pursuit until you bless me, until I know from you what this is about. 
and what the next step is as I'm wrestling for my future. Jacob did this, and he did it all night. And as the morning was breaking, the angel said, and I'm paraphrasing, all right, I'm going to bless you. But before he blessed them, watch this. Halfway through the night, the angel, the Bible says, the angel, Jesus manifested in word, hit his hip and dislocated his lip. His hip. Hit his hip and dislocated his hip. But the Bible says, Jathan, that Jacob kept wrestling. He didn't allow what was going on with his body to stop what he needed to have happen in his spirit. Because he knew if he could push past his body and get a breakthrough in the spirit, then the breakthrough of the spirit would address what he had to deal with in his body. Sometimes you are moments away from a breakthrough, but you allow fatigue, you allow frustration, you allow, why is this taking so long? You allow, it shouldn't have to take all of this. You allow different things that are impacting your physical to stop you when you are just moments away from a breakthrough in the spiritual. But Jacob fought through what was going on in his body, kept fighting, until eventually the morning was getting ready to come, and the word said to him, hey, what's your name? Because remember, the word, which is Jesus, knows what you're really after. The Bible never said what it was that Jacob wanted the angel to bless him with. But the word's response, the angel's response to Jacob was an indication of what it was that Jacob was after. The word or the angel asked Jacob, what's your name? Jacob said, my name is Jacob. The word or the angel said to him, not anymore. From this day forth, you shall be called Israel. To you, that may not be significant, but in Jewish culture, it was huge. It meant everything because your name indicated your destiny. Your name was the inclination of your future. So for the word to change his name means that the word was giving him his future, which means the fight that he was fighting, he won. And now he was seeing his future. The name Jacob meant supplanter. It meant to try to take from somebody else the thing that you wanted. Jacob didn't want to be like that anymore. So when he got done wrestling with the word, the word changed his name, thus changing his life. And the name Israel means this. It means prevailing. And it means a prince with God. So Jacob, in a night of wrestling, what he wanted was for his future to be changed. Because remember, his brother was on the way to kill him. And if something didn't shift by morning, Jacob was possibly going to be dead. But as Jacob was wrestling with God and wrestling with his future during the night, there was a shift that came because he was willing to take on the fight. He understood that he had a fight on his hands, and the fight that was on his hands was for his future because his future was arriving in the morning. And he said, if it takes all night, I, it, it's just going to take all night. If, if, if it's going to take all night, I'm going to pray all night because if something doesn't change by the morning, I'm finished. I'm gone. I'm no longer here. I need my past to not be my present or my future. I need the word. I need God to change this. And he did. He said, Jacob, you are no longer a supplanter or somebody who has to steal something from somebody else because you don't think you have something for yourself. Jacob, you are now a prevailing person. 
You have prevailed this fight. You have won this fight. And what you have won is that your name is changed and you are now a prince with God. When the morning came and his brother showed up, read the scripture, you'll see what happened. But I'll tell you this much, Jacob, who became Israel, became the father of Israel. Out of Israel came the 12 tribes of Israel. Out of Israel came Judah. I, are y'all here? Out of Judah came King David. Out of these lines came Jesus. If it wasn't for Jacob wrestling with the word on that night, it would have impacted the future, not just of his legacy, but the future of what God intended to do. It would have impacted how David came. It would have impacted Jesus' arrival. But because he fought for something that was greater than him, God said, I'll give you that future because you're willing. Give me a handheld microphone because you're willing to fight for it. Are y'all still here? Because you're willing to fight for it. And that's what he did. He kept fighting. He kept fighting. He kept fighting. He kept fighting until he got his future. So then my question to you, and I'm done. I'm done right here. Is your future worth fighting for? And if it is, then you got to fight on your hand. Because when you realize that your future is bigger than just you, that it impacts generations beyond you. Is your keyboard cut down? I, your I don't clearly yes. know what all I'm fighting for it's right like now. Scratching. But I do know that because I know I got to fight on my hand, and I'm not going to stop until the word blesses my soul. I know that because of right what there. I'm doing right now, it's blessing my great, great, great grandchildren. I think it's that patch. You'll be able to look back and say, because of great, great granddaddy, we are now in what I'll we're in now. We are now doing what we're doing now. Okay. We're now able to be a blessing to the world because my great, great grandfather, Jason Turner, decided to fight for his future. And I'm so glad that he did. What will the future say about you? Stand to your feet, I'm done. What will the future say about you? Try to, try to, try to, Better change, yet, try to fade out and change What the will you say about yourself? That what you have, what you are experiencing, what God promised is worth fighting <laughs> I gotta for. Turn it off. My mic Amen. Off Let's pray. Every head bow, every eye closed. Father, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice, whether they are here on this campus or whether they are watching us across the United States through our virtual campus. Father, I thank you that today that they are seeing that they got a fight on their hands. But if truth be told, it's a fixed fight. We already won because you already got the victory. All you're waiting for us to do is to just step in the ring, to be willing to fight for our future, fight for it in prayer, fight for it in the way that you've designed us, whether that's worshiping, whether that is studying, whether that is playing an instrument, whether that's walking the floor, whatever it is, God. Whatever it is, God, it's the thing that you've given to us to have conversation with you to have clarity with you, to be able to hear you so that we can fight and gain the victory for the future that you have promised us from your spoken prophetic word and promised us from your written prophetic word. We thank you that our future is not in jeopardy. Our future is not uh, uh, unclear, but our future is bright because we got your promises. Our future is clear because we have your promises. Our future is known because we have your word. God, help us to move like this. Help us to not be in a place of bewilderment about what's going to happen next. Help us to understand that we guide what's next by how we pray with you. How we prevail with you in prayer speaks to how we prevail with everything else. 
So God, help us to fight for our future and to fight for it in prayer. Now, God, I pray that if there be anybody under the sound of my voice that don't know you, that right now they're raising their hand and their heart to you, and that right now, Father, you are coming into their life because you don't make receiving you difficult. Thank you right now for every soul that is saved. And I thank you right now for every person that is being reclaimed back to you. And we give you the glory for it. And we give you the honor for it. God, we praise you for what you've done in here today. And we praise you for what you've done in us and how it's going to carry us through today and into our future because our future is great because you're in it. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Let every glad heart shout hallelujah. Come on, if this word was a blessing to you, put your hands together and thank our great God for a great word. Woo, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You may have your seats. We have been talking about the 111 offering that comes from Deuteronomy 1 and 11. And I want to encourage you to trust God to step out into a place you've never been before and in your offering to reflect this 111. We already know what our tithe is because tithe is 10% of the increase from the work of your hands. But in this season, until God takes it out of my heart, I want to encourage you about the 111 offering. It comes from Deuteronomy 111. says, may the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are and bless you as he has promised you. We're in a season of fighting for these promises. And there's something financially that's attached to this 111 offering. Pastor Jason, what is this 111 offering? It is this. In your offering, let it reflect the numbers 111. Whether it is that you're giving $51.11, or you're giving $111, or you're giving $201.11. Y'all see where I'm going? Make sure there's a 111 in your offering. A 111 in your offering as you are standing on the prophetic promise of this scripture that God is going to do what he said in this scripture concerning you. Amen? Amen? So 111 offering. For somebody, it's going to be $1,111. I said this jokingly last week, but it, would have, but it was deep in sincerity. Somebody one day, it's going to be $111,000. Amen? It's even hard for y'all to get that out. It, what? Amen. It could be you. Come on in here. So we're believing God for great things and for him to do great things in your life because of this offering. On the screen behind me are our various giving platforms. Also, when you came in on the table or on the chair was an envelope as well. You can take this time now to prepare your tithe and offering. And in just a few moments, I'll have you stand and we will receive our tithe and offering together. Amen. Ha has this message series been as good to y'all as it has been to me? Amen. Cool. Cool. I love it. Absolutely love it. Hallelujah. All right. Stand to your feet with your tithe and offering. Hold your envelope or your device up towards the, towards the air, towards heaven. Father, we thank you for every person now that is releasing their tithe and their 111 offering according to your inspired prophetic word for us in this season. Thank you for the increase. Thank you for the miracles that are going to happen in their lives because of this moment. I thank you, God, for doing the ridiculous. I thank you that because of our giving, we will not miss a meal, a bill, or a deal. Not just as individuals, but also as a church. Thank you, God, you're going to take care of every need, and everything's going to be responded to. Thank you that we understand that the blessings that you give to us is not just for us, 
but it's to get through us so we can be a blessing to other people as you lead in God. We thank you for this now, and we give you glory. Let everything that's received be used for, used for the work of ministry, for the continued preaching of the gospel, that we'll always be able to tell a dying world about a living Christ, and we give you praise for it now. In Jesus' name, let every glad heart say amen. Amen. Precious hearts, you may have your seats. If you have an envelope, just keep it up, and our host will come to serve you now. Come on, let's sing it one time through. Blessings. Blessings and glory. And honor. And honor. They all. They all belong to you. One more time. Blessings. Blessings and glory. And honor. And honor. They all. They all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Life has a way of throwing us off course, causing us to lose that glimmer of hope that once upon a time twinkled in our eye. We can all remember the days when we were filled with enormous ideas, convinced we were going to take the world by storm. But as life goes on, that storm crushes us and it leaves us with the remnants of a shattered dream. At this very moment, we are all in need of a voice of encouragement that will help us to rise from the depths of despair and be filled with hope as we once again pursue our dreams. We need to be reminded that we have purpose. Our dreams still matter and that the world is waiting on us. This is why I wrote this book because I know what it is to be crushed with disappointment. I know what it is to wrestle with hopelessness. I know what it is to be down and counted out. But I also know what it is to rise and stand on top of the mountain and lift my hands in triumph because I had the boldness to dream again. <laughs>